morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Wednesday. The week's almost over. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, as always, we have uh, two connector faculty who have kindly volunteered their time to come and speak with you. I'll, they will introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Sarah Reynolds. I'm teaching the connector on child development and household surveys around the world. This connector is great if you're interested in general social sciences. We touch slightly on public health, economics, sociology, and demography. Uh, we will be looking at two child development outcomes in household surveys from developing countries around the world, nutrition measured by height, and also education of these children. Uh, throughout the semester, we'll develop variables based on income, assets, family structure, and parents' education. And so we'll look at how these variables correlate with the child development outcomes in these different countries. And the data come from the World Bank. Uh, what I'm most excited about is that different groups of students will be working on different countries. And as you all have different databases, you will have the same code, but the results, the different graphs that we produce, the different regressions and analyses that we do, will be different for each country, and it'll be interesting to compare across the student groups. So if you're interested, check out the Children, Child Development, and Household Surveys Connector. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you may have noticed uh, recently that immigration is a fairly hot topic in the news. Uh, this is not without precedent. Throughout American history, there have been periods of intense anxiety about immigration. Back in the 1600s, uh, colonists complained bitterly that, Eng that England was sending its criminals to America. But back then, it was true. At other times, Americans have been anxious about the ideas that immigrants bring, the diseases that immigrants might spread, the education or literacy of immigrants, the religion, particularly Catholicism, but now Muslim. Um, and above all, Americans have been anxious about the race and nationality of immigrants. And yet at the same time, America is and continues to be a country of immigrants, a country that is remarkably good at integrating and adapting with immigrants. The Connector course I'm teaching is called Data science in demography and immigration. Data science and immigration are, of course, familiar, uh, but let me explain demography. Uh, demography is the most important social science that you've never heard of. Uh, we study population and how it develops. We study fertility, mortality, and migration in both mathematical ways. Uh, for example, investigating how declines in fertility lead to increases in population age distributions. And um, we also are interested in the micro level, things about what, for example, what makes people have fewer or more children. In this connector course, we're going to take a very fast look at America's long history of migration and immigration, beginning with the first immigrants uh, about 20,000 years ago across the land bridge from Asia. And we'll see how that timing of that is absolutely critical to what happened to population in America after 1492. Uh, then we'll turn to data, and we'll study migration and mortality of American slaves, and the location choice of immigrants, and the social and economic trajectory of Hispanic immigrants. Okay. Um, the course is going to be really, really fun. It's not going to be a lot of work, and everybody's going to get an A. Okay. Um, the course meets in, uh, at 10 o'clock in B6 Evans, a room with exquisite artificial lighting and delightful views of its own four walls. Okay, thanks. Oh.
Right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to start with an apology to the person who tried to talk to me, or at least very politely came up to say hello to me uh, just outside the class. I didn't even turn around and look at him because I was really focused. I have to get a multimedia presentation going, and it better work, otherwise we have problems. Uh, so I apologize. Whoever you are, please come and talk to me after class. I also have this other medium, and the reason it's out is I read my email on it. And I want to read an email out that was posted on Piazza for this class um, at 6.37 a.m. today. There are people who wake up at that hour, people. Just please be aware. Okay. The post says this. Hi, friends. I see a lot of posts saying, sorry if this is stupid. I know this is stupid. No, it's not stupid. If you had that question, I'm sure many others have that question too. So thank you to all the anons, non-anons for finally posting what a lot of us were thinking but were too scared, lazy to post ourselves but never feel stupid for asking a question. Okay, so I'm an old fuddy-duddy and I don't understand the social media language but I believe that if you type plus one it means you second this. Yes? So I'm going to type 500, plus 550 one for each of the 500 people in the class, including the poster, plus the 50 staff. Because we all agree with this. And the class is greatly enriched by the people who ask questions during lecture and on piazza and so on. Um, and so I thank you for coming, because you are the people who are going to ask those questions and make this class good. All right? So thank you to the poster and thank all of you for showing up and participating. I really appreciate it. I could not teach without you. Right, so um, we're going to do uh, a lecture on arrays and other types, and at the moment this makes... Carl, are you still here? Is this you? Um, and we'll see as we go along what that means. I'm going to rather swiftly uh, do a... This is not alive. Okay, here we go. All right, you know this. Office hours you can find under weekly schedule. Homework one, the early deadline is today. The regular deadline is tomorrow. There are some office hours this afternoon. There are some on uh, Thursday. But, you know, we pack it in on Tuesday because we'd like you to get uh, stuff done in reasonable time. There are submission instructions. This is not a new announcement. This is pretty much the same thing that I posted on Monday, except Wednesday has been re uh, replaced by today. Uh, questions about homework at this point I won't take them here please post on Piazza I'd like to get to where we want to get at the end of lecture and if I have a few minutes we'll take logistical questions right? if you are having something that says the test is not recognized or not running wherever you are in the cell please run all above then try your test again Okay. so um, a uh, review of something that you actually did in lab and have used quite a bit in homework, uh, formerly known as call expression, but it's this thing. You see that? What's the answer to that? 42. 42. Terrific. The answer to life, the universe, and everything. Okay. Uh, that has three components. Uh, that's the name of the function. The function operates on minus 42. That's called the argument. So this is just terminology. Nothing new happening here. Uh, and uh, there are parentheses around the argument to tell the function what to operate on. So I kindly gave it minus 42, but I could have given it, you know, 42 divided by minus 3, and it would have computed that and then computed the absolute value. So uh, language. There's the function, there's the argument. Um, you ha uh, to use a function, you put parentheses around the argument. This is like f of x notation in math, for those of you who did some math. Um, <coughs> And now the language, this, uh, uh, when you run the, uh, the line of code, what will be returned is the value 42. Nothing new here. Questions about any of this? I also want to point out that you know that some uh, functions can take multiple arguments, which are separated by commas. Take a look at that. Do you agree, disagree? You good? What's the function there? What's the function? Max, terrific. Uh, what are the arguments? Three, eight, and one. And to let the function know that you're separating them, you have commas. There's parentheses to let the uh, function know what, what to take the max off, and it returns the max. It returns eight. Uh, you don't, in some functions, take arguments that you don't have to enter. 
So you, have you seen the function round? I believe you did in lab. Yes, no? No? A question first, yes. Okay. Arguments are the objects on which the function operates, the things inside the parentheses. So this says, take the absolute value of minus 42. Absolute value of what? That's the argument. Right? The absolute value of what? The answer is minus 42. Minus 42 is the argument. So now I go to the next line here. This, I'm asking, the, uh, I'm asking Python to take the maximum. Yes? Maximum of what? Of the numbers 3, 8, and 1. That set of numbers 3, 8, and 1 are the arguments. Keep going. I'll do that for every single function. Right? Okay. Uh, so the round function rounds to x many decimal places. So what I have asked the function to do is to round the number 5.7682, which I just typed in at random, to three decimal places. Okay, what are the arguments? Round what? 5.7682, that's one of the arguments. To how many decimal places? Three, that's another argument. The function needs to know both of those to know what to pop out at you, right? Okay, uh, you don't have to enter a number of decimal places. If you just say round a number, it will give you the closest integer. All right? So what is it assuming that that number of decimal places it is? It's just zero. So the reason I'm telling you this is there is another, uh, uh, well, first, there is the term optional argument, and second, there is what it does by default. If you do not enter the value of the optional argument, and that's a very technical term for if you don't tell it how many decimal places, it has to make some decision about what to do. That decision, when you don't give it how many decimal places, is called what it does by default. Right? Um, so this is just language, and one thing you should uh, recognize about learning how to code is you never learn it in lecture. You just never learn it in lecture. In lecture, there's a bunch of stuff said, and you know it kind of makes sense, maybe. Uh, and then you watch more, and uh, you learn a bit more, but you learn by actually getting in there and making messes. So I am imploring all of you to get in there and make as many messes as you possibly can. And that's how you're going to learn. As you see functions used over and over and over again, and you see the language used over and over and over again, it will become uh, smooth. Today, I warn you, uh, there may be like a whole slew of terminology. Please don't expect that you need to know this by this afternoon. Right? You, it, it will grow uh, as the term passes. Okay. So, uh, so now there are a lot of functions. You've seen abs, you've seen min, you've seen max, yes? I've seen, I uh, just, just showed you around, there's a lot of functions, there's functions that do statistics, there's functions that do physics, there's functions that do graphics, and so on. These functions are organized into modules that sort of hang together and make sense. Um, and so a module is just a collection of functions, and the first one that I'm going to show you is the module that simply collects all the math functions. We are going to use very few of them. But you've taken math classes, and you've heard that there are functions like log and sine and inverse sine and all of that kind of stuff, the math functions. Uh, and so they're all collected into a module called math. How do you use it? Well, uh, when you run Python, uh, the, the, what you're running isn't cluttered up with a bunch of stuff you don't need. When you need something, you need to import it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the module by saying import the module, import name of module. And then when we call a function from that model, a module, we name the module dot function. This should be very clear. That's not squirt. That is square root. Uh, so math dot square root 9 returns 3.0, right? Please note that it is returning a decimal value, even though it, the answer is three, because that's a reasonable uh, thing to decide, because you are, the next thing you're going to ask is math dot square root 10, and that will need decimals. Okay? Now, uh, having said all this, how about we actually use it? You ready? All right. Okay, so I'm going to do what I said. Actually, I'm going to run this cell, and I am going to import math. 
Um, and when you run that cell, apparently nothing happens, but a bunch of stuff has been imported rather fast. And so I'm going to do what we said would happen, and we're going to see. Okay? All right. Now, math has a lot of functions. I'm going to tell you this about math. You're hardly going to need the math ones, but there's something that's worth knowing. What functions are there? Where is a list? You shouldn't have to go to Google to find it, though you can. Google is your friend. You don't know how to do something? Not only is there a post on Piazza, there's 700 people on Stack Exchange or Google who have said, I don't know how to do this. How do I do this? It's wonderful. Uh, I thought I was silly for not knowing stuff and looking stuff up. And then I went and asked John De Niro something. And I said, wait, wait a minute, how does this work again? He said, uh, and then he Googled it, and he got Stack Exchange, which is exactly what I do. So I felt much better. OK. Uh, what you do to find out all the functions is you do math. Uh, that's the name. And where you would put in the name of the function, you just hit the tab key. You know where a tab key is? Arc cos, arc sine, arc ten, da 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 whole bunch. All right? You can compute away to your heart's content. We're not going to use almost any of them. Uh, next semester, I'm going to teach a probability class that's going to use a lot of them. But uh, this class, we're not going to use any of them. I do want to look at this one, factorial. Okay? So we're going to use that. And so I am going to do math.factorial of 3, and it gives me the answer 6. So what is this? Um, it is the number of ways to shuffle, ah, shuggle, uh, three items. Bear with me. You agree, if my three items are A, B, and C, that's one shuffle. I'm OK so far? Yes? Six of them? OK, now there's a mass, it's a fairly uh, very accessible math reason, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm just saying that the number of ways uh, to count um, the, no the number of all possible shuffles of three items is uh, obtained by math factorial three. And I want to show you something. If you haven't seen, seen it already, if you start a code cell by this, now I have code. OK. Math factorial of 30 is the number of ways that what happens? You shuffle 30 items. OK, and bear with me if you say, I don't care. Um, actually, let me make you care. How about that? That's the number of ways to shuffle a deck of cards. OK, point here. These numbers get big very quickly. OK? OK. So they get big very quickly. This is not a math class. Why do we care? You care. You care because we talked about randomizing uh, subjects into treatment and control. right? So you have to have a way of randomizing that you understand what the chances are. So here is a very straightforward way of randomizing. Supposing you have 1,000 subjects in your study, and you want to randomize them into treatment and control, one natural way is to write each of the 10,000 uh, write 10, people, 1,000 people in your study. 10,000 is too big. OK, 1,000 people in your study, you write each of the 1,000 names on an index card, you shuffle that deck of index cards, right? And then you deal. Treatment, control, treatment, control, treatment, control. Is that not a way of randomizing? And it's a perfectly well understood way of randomizing. And so therefore, this number then becomes important, does it not? It is the total number of possible shuffles you could make. And why do you want to know that? Well, you want to know what is the chance that all the guys get into one group and all the women get into the other, right? What is the chance that all the tall people get into one group and what uh, all the others get uh, to the other? So now you have issues of how many are there. So that's how many there are total. OK, ready? That's a number. 
units place, tens place, one hundreds place, da 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 da, and the population of the world is only in the billions, and that fits very comfortably just down here. And then the number keeps going and going and going. That's one number. I don't know what this you know gazillionth place here is called. Okay. That's a number. So they get really big. And therefore, it is very helpful to A, have an understanding of a computing system, and B, an understanding of probabilities, randomness. And you are going to develop that during this class. Okay? That's one of the reasons why uh, I pointed this out. The other reason for me to point this out is that this number is exact. It's an integer. It's exact. You get an integer out of these functions. You get an exact value, unlike, remember last time? Remember? Is that exact? It should, because no, the 60 should go on forever. Nothing can go on forever. And there is a truncation here. It's not that it's not showing you infinitely many sixes. It doesn't have them. These aren't exact, right? So the integer is different from this is called a floating point number or a float. Uh, never mind. You can think of it as a decimal. Uh, those aren't necessarily exact. So I'm going to go from very big numbers to small numbers, because we're going to have to be able to deal with all kinds of numbers and read them. Uh, and so here is a reasonably small number. So 5.43 is pretty small. On this scale, it's tiny. OK, I'm going to make it smaller. I'm going to divide by 100. Fine. I got 0 0.005. I should have got 3, should I not? Yep. I got 2999. And there's this lovely 4. Yeah. So, you know, just be a little relaxed about all this. In this class, that degree of accuracy is not going to matter for you. Um, okay, so now, haha, -ha, suddenly the nines have gone away. Be prepared for stuff like this. It's going to happen, it's not going to kill you. Just be prepared that if you keep, you know, once you keep calculating, you know, one number used in another calculation, another calculation, as we said last time, errors do compound. So we will just focus on the first couple of decimal, first few decimal places in an answer, typically. OK, so now I want to keep going, um, not because I am just perverse. All right, so that's 5.43 uh, relative to 10,000. Mm. Oops. OK, that's not an error. It just looks different. And I want you to remind, what is that called, by the way? That is called scientific notation, and I just want to go through what it means because I know there are a good number of people who uh, uh, are not used to this, uh, and there's an equally good number who knew this once but have forgotten. Uh, and for the rest of you, just uh, dream about something for a little while. Okay, so what this says is you take the number 5.43, and I'm going to turn it into something that's not a number. I'm just going to put a placeholder here. You see the e to the minus 05? That's just telling you, go 5. This is your decimal place. Just move it 5 to the left. All right, so that's 1 to the left, 2 to the left, 3 to the left, 4. Right? This is not a number. This is a nonsense. OK, so now that's where your decimal place should go. Remove that. That's the number. Right? I've gone through it very slowly. Every time you see this, you should try and do this move if it doesn't come naturally to you, just to make sure that it's the right number. All right, it is the right number. OK, so why like this? Because it's really hard to see how big this is. It's very hard to count zeros quickly in your head. John can do it. I can't. Right? So this tells me that there are you know, four zeros. Before the five, I have a much clearer sense of what the number is. And it's also it's compact. Right? So uh, I mean, after all, if we, yeah. So that is a scientific notation. It pops up, and it especially pops up when you have very small numbers. When are you going to have very small numbers? You are going to have very small numbers when there are rare elements in your population. And you're trying to figure out what's the probability that you get them, what's the probability that you get two of them. Those are going to get even rarer. And so we might have to deal with very small numbers, and those are going to look like this. Okay. All right. So I've talked a lot about uh, types of numbers and sort of technicalities which are a little dry. And always there is the issue, who cares? Um, well, do you remember this from uh, last time? That was Minard's data about Napoleon's army. 
and I want you to look at different data types. I've labeled three of them. So these are decimal numbers. These are what we are now calling floats. The number of men is an integer. Now, uh, by the way, these are obviously approximations. Right? They, they were not nice round numbers that were always there. Right? So, but in any case, it's a, it's a whole number. Uh, and then these are words. So strings, texts, are another kind of data that we'll talk about in just a moment. Okay, so that's you know, looking nitty-gritty into a single cell is a float, it's a, an integer, it's a string. Now I want you to look at a bigger picture. It is actually really interesting to look at this sequence. And didn't we look at this sequence? It started here and it ended here. What was the percent drop? You remember doing that? Yep, what was the biggest drop? Okay, so this... Uh, is something like a list of numbers, and we are going to see that it is uh, actually uh, can be thought of as an, uh, what we are going to call an array. So each of these columns by itself is a type, and then the whole thing is another. The whole thing is a kind of data, and that will be called a table. So today we're going to talk about, this is why we're talking about types and arrays, and then on Friday we're going to be talking about tables. Why is this important? Because it is a wonderful way to organize data. You can quickly see uh, relations, um, and you can extract what you need to work with uh, from tables. So this is why today we are going to spend some time talking about types of data. So we've talked about, uh, thus far, ints and floats. Take a look at that. Seem familiar, not familiar? Int, integer of any size, not quite any size. And there's at some point, uh, Python decides that your number is infinity. But I mean, for our purposes, it's pretty much any size. Float, fractional number, there are limitations to accuracy. Um, and the floats might be printed using scientific notation. All agree? That's what we've seen so far? OK, very rapid pass through strings. Uh, what's a string? It's text. It's text. You can't do arithmetic on it. Uh, so here's some example of strings. And uh, you uh, uh, delimit a string by quotes, either single quotes or double quotes. We'll talk about them in just a moment. Those are strings. And you can do plus and times on strings, but uh, they don't do what plus and times on numbers do. And uh, I think the only way to get this is by actually doing something. Shall we do something? All right, let's do something. Okay. Uh, where am I? What's the difference? I use single quotes in one, double quotes in the other. Right? Uh, you can use either. That's fine. Sometimes your hand is forced. Why is my hand forced there? Why do I have to use double quotes outside? Because a string already includes a single quote, and we're going to have terrible confusion about where's the end of the string if we only use single quotes. All okay? Uh, and while we're about it, let's just do what I just said we shouldn't do. See what happens? Confusion. Because uh, Python thinks the string has ended. Um, and so, uh, conversely, now I need a single quote outside. Because anybody know where that's from? OK, I'm going to ask again. I have 400 people in this room, I think. Where's that from? 
I'm sorry? It's something to do with Lancelot. Very good. Something to, so nobody reads Tennyson anymore. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Go read it. Jon Snow read it. It came out right about when, uh, before he was starting to get interested in cholera. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Take a poetry class. Okay. Uh, the reason for doing this here is if you have quotes in your... If you're, whatever kind of quote you have in your string, you have to uh, deal with it by putting the right kind of quotes outside. And I know that there are 100 people who are thinking, what if I have both kinds of quotes? Okay. Here we go. Um, because we have to take care of all kinds of situations. What we're going to do is we're going to go through what I talked to you about before, which is pluses. Um, let me see here. Okay. That's a string. All right, the plus on the string just closes them together, no space. Times. Okay, so I want you to notice something. It gloms four of them together with no space. So where's the space from? It's in my string. I have to put it in. Right? Strings are a pain. Uh, because you have to be really careful, and you can combine stuff like this. Now, let me get the rhythm right here. There you go. All right, so you can have unlimited fun with this kind of stuff. Just you have to be careful where your spaces are, where your commas are, where your periods are. And so if you really want to do text, uh, well, you have to pay attention. Right? Now, I promise you, it's very rare that you will want to do such text manipulations in this class. You will have to look at you know, the name of a city and know that that's a string. You will have to look at the name of a column of numbers and know that that's a string, and you will see things coming up in quotes, and you need to know what that is. And uh, you also, it may be a really good idea to check this out. Um, so, what's the answer going to be? All right. What's the answer going to be? One, two, one, two, one, two. Yes, because now this is a string. It's not a number. The minute you put something in quotes, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a string. And then string operations work. Questions about this? Yes. Ah, it doesn't plus here. In this line, the question is, it didn't plus hate and then times five. No, order of operations. Order of operations still works. Good question. Thank you. Good observation. Um, so uh, also, please... What about that? That's a mess. That it doesn't know what to do. Right? Okay, so that's enough time spent talking about strings. I'll come back to strings later when you actually want to start working with them. Yes? How is this different from the print function? Ah, so this is actually computing a string. Uh, print writes out uh, a string as... Do you mind holding that thought? Um... The print doesn't involve a calculation, right? Unless you put a calculation. So, so let me back up. I'm uh, uh, all tied up in knots. Okay. 
often what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to print something that is going to come out on output that I want elsewhere. This is just code that is computing. I might do print this string, and that will come out in a certain place in some of my output in a report or something. All right? right now I'm just computing it. We've got a lot to talk about strings before. Thank you for that. Remind me uh, when we start seeing more graphics. Right? How, how did you get that thing to say that it'll, it'll probably be a print statement using some string manipulation like this? Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, we've got strings. What I'd like to do is now finally go to the cell that I've been hiding. Um, actually, that. Uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to look at all of these numbers at once. Um, and so what I did was I just typed them all in. Please note that these, aren't those, these are the numbers of people, but in thousands of people. Yes? Not in how many people. It's in thousands. I just didn't want to type all the zeros. Okay. okay. What make array does is it turns this list of arguments into something that is called an array. And I'll show you what it looks like. That thing is an array. Please, I implore you, uh, ignore the parentheses. It's just telling you that it's an array. The array is in here. And that's just, you can think of it as uh, what it's called a list object. It's just uh, you know, a sequence of numbers that's, as, that's one object. And, but it has particular properties that make it really great for data science. Um, so uh, let me actually quickly tell you one thing that you can do with this. OK, len is short for length. Okay, what this means is it's the length of this array. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight elements in there. All right? Now, you can, of course, count that by looking, but you're going to have huge arrays, and it's really useful, step one, to know how many I have. Fine, but uh, what the array is really useful for is do you remember that we looked at proportions of people who were left at the end? Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take your array, and I am going to look at that array relative to the starting point. Is clear what I'm doing? I'm trying to look at those numbers relative to the starting point. I want to see what happens when you divide an array by a number. What do you think happened? Each one of those numbers in the array got divided by 145. That is very handy. Very handy indeed. If you want to convert from inches to uh, centimeters, you've got an array of heights and inches, you want to convert to centimeters, just multiply the array by 2.54. You don't have to deal one element at a time. Very handy for changing units. I want to point out this, this is about eight and a bit percent. Eight and a bit percent was still alive at the end. Last time we had said that something like 92% had died. Same statement, made in a different way. Okay? So the arrays are very handy because they allow us to do element-wise operations. By, by element-wise operations, I mean that when you do an arithmetic operation like that, it is done to every one of the arrays, uh, every one of the elements that you have in the array. Okay, so now there is a module. There is a module that works... Bu yes? Uh, you have to import data science... It may, uh, so, if it, so the question is, I tried to do make array, it said not defined. Uh, you have to import data science. Are you working on your own laptop or are you working on our system? You were using, yeah, okay, so possibly it's a different version of data science library. Um, okay, so uh, remember we talked about modules, collections of functions. There is a wonderful collection of functions called NumPy. Okay, now in Python, uh, there are all kinds of collections that end with pi. There's scipy, scientific Python, numpy, numerical Python, simpy, symbolic Python. So there's a lot of pi going on. You have your labs are dot i p y n b, 
Yes, dot IPython notebook. So py appears a lot. This one is used a lot. And do you remember that you have to, when you call a function from it, you have to give the name of the module, then dot name of function? Yep. So instead of typing numpy, if you could abbreviate it, that would be great. So the classic abbreviation is NP. So we're going to import the module, but when we call functions, we don't have to say numpy dot. We are going to say NP dot just because we hate typing. OK, so we've got that. And take a look at this array. One of the things we looked at last time was how much drop there was from one city to the next. Do you remember that? And the biggest drop was at Moscow? Yep. I'm going to show you a function, np.diff. Right? What this does is it just takes successive differences. It will say how much of a drop was there from here to here, then how much of a drop was there from here to here, and then how much of a drop was there from here to here, etc. And so if I do that then I get the drops. Yes? 145 to 140, that's the minus 5? Yes? I'm sorry? Oh, I see. Len, good, 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 good observation. Len did not have a module associated with it. That's one of the built-ins. It's like abs. Right? It works on a bunch of stuff, yes. What is the advantage to uh, using array versus a list? Uh, so I have not talked about lists, nor am I going to for a while. Uh, I will answer that question, though, because there is somebody who knows about lists. Uh, it's exactly this, element-wise operation and element-wise addition and subtraction, as we are going to come to. It's very, very handy for data. Right? So bear with me, and uh, we'll... Um, We'll come to that. OK, so yes? Um, can you make multiple rows for an array? Yes, you can have a two-dimensional array. The, answer, uh, the question was, can you make multiple rows for an array? Yes, you can have two-dimensional arrays. You can have multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, what we will have as tables will be collections of arrays. Each column will be array. Hold your horses. Lots of questions are going to pop up now. You just have to be a little, uh, uh, keep a list of those questions. If I don't answer them, then keep asking them. Sometimes I'll say I'll answer on Friday. OK, so uh, this is useful uh, because you can do things like this. Uh, there are some arrays that are very, very handy, particular arrays that are easy to create using NumPy. Uh, and one of the arrays you really want to be able to create, you just want to create a list of numbers. If I want to, the list of numbers, one, two, three, four, five. It shouldn't, I should not have to type out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There must be some way of doing it, all right? OK, so I'm going to show you np.arrange. OK, now, people say arrange. It's not a range. There's only one R. OK, that's not bad spelling. It's, it's a range that is an array, all right? OK, np.arrange, I'm going to, oh, what should we do? How about we take 5? You don't know what this does. I'm just going to run this. OK, notice what it did. Uh, the argument was an integer. And it gave me the integers starting at 0 up to but not including my argument. So this is what the language does. And in uh, Python, you will get very used to starting at 0 and not quite getting there. But how many are there in that array? There are five. If I did len and I could, uh, I would get five. Okay. If you start at 0, and you want five elements, you will end at four. That is something that you please would uh, start internalizing. OK, but what if I wanted uh, the numbers four through 10? Then I will do start at four. I want the numbers four through 10, right? The integers four through 10. Where should I, what should I type in here? <coughs> type in 11. Because if I type in 10, where is it going to stop? Nine. At nine, and then I will be sad. So. All OK? All right. Now, I am weird, and I'm going to be very weird, and I want to start at you know, 1.87, and then I want to go up by 3.2 every time until I reach such and such. OK, fine. I should be able to do that as well. We're going to do an easy case of that. 
how about we start at um, one, and I'm just going to type in and we go up in steps of two. What that says is start at one, next one is one plus two, that's three, and after that it's five, etc. until you hit but not quite 14. Okay, now of course you won't hit 14 in this case. All okay? So it's start, end, step. Um, this one, I'm working with integers today. Later on, you can this last one, you can make uh, with all kinds of decimal numbers and so on. Once we need that, we will do it. Um, and so, let's see, do we have a summary slide here? Where am I? No. Um, okay, so this is sy systematic arrays you can generate quite easily. How much time do I have? I have six minutes, okay. Uh, I would like to show you something. I have three minutes. Okay, let's try this. Okay, can somebody uh, please tell me what that answer is going to be? So I'm going to start at two. Yes, what's the next number going to be? Four, and then six, and then that's it. So this is going to be two, four, six. Everyone agree? Questions, anybody? Okay. Uh, that's 246. How about... What will I get now? So I'm subtracting 1 from the previous array. What am I going to get? 1, 3, 5, because 1 is going to be subtracted from each one of those. Yes? Okay. I'm taking my original array, I'm adding one to it. What am I going to get? I had two, four, six, I'm going to get? Three, five, seven. All clear? Right? Bear with me, I have a reason for doing this. Okay, now I'm going to show you something else. If I do array one divided by array two, I get that. And so let me make a little comment here. You remember that array 1 is 2, 4, 6, and array 2 is, what was it? 1, 3, 5. Can somebody tell me what happened here? Do you see the element-wise operation? 2 divided by 1. Yes, that's the 2. 4 divided by 3 is 1 and a third. That's right here. And then 6 divided by 5 that's 1.2. That's right there. Yeah? You have two arrays of the same size. You can do element by element operations. They have to be the same size, obviously. Otherwise, this all falls apart. Okay? Okay. Bear with me. What do you think np.prod does? You've got all of these numbers, three numbers. NP.prod does what do you think it does. It takes the product. Okay. All right. So I'm taking a product of bizarre numbers, and I get something like three. So who cares? Here's why we care. Okay. So we're going to do NP.prod of uh, array one over array two. That's what we did, yes? And then we're going to multiply that by np.prod of array one over array three, because we can do that as well. There's nothing stopping us. And because we are weird, we are going to multiply that by two, all right? We're just going to do this because we can, okay? So we're doing this. All okay? I got 2.92, whatever, who cares? Okay, we've got a computer. We've got a computer. I stopped at six. I'm not going to stop at six. I don't know. Whatever. Right? Some big number. Right? So that's two, four, six, eight, da, 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 all the even numbers, and then you have one set of odds and another set of odds. You ready? 
You ready? All right. Huh? Still working. I had too many zeros, poor thing. <laughs> Come on, my clock's ticking. Ah. Um, remind me how, somebody remind me how to abort this. Sorry? That. I don't want to redo the kernel. Ah, sorry. Okay. Didn't like it. Okay, we'll do a f fewer. You recognize that? Who's that? <laughs> 